FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. Welcome. You are listening to the Financial Survival Network. I'm Kerry Lutz. It's August 14th, 2017. Uh, This month's almost gone. I mean, we're really uh, going through 2017 like it's nothing. I hope you've been a great year for you. You've been accomplishing your goals and we're always trying to bring you information, guests that will help you cut through the nonsense and really, really get down to what's important, workable strategies to help you and your family become more secure and and more prosperous, of course. Uh, and that means we've got Garrett Gunderson with us today. Garrett, you are an entrepreneur, financial advocate, and founder of Wealth Factory and author of a couple of books, the New York Times bestselling book, Killing Sacred Cows. And recently, uh, you've got a book out that you'll have a special offer for later, uh, What Would the Rockefellers Do?, which I find the title quite intriguing. Uh, first, if you got any questions, as always, for myself or Garrett, email us at kl at kerrylutz.com. Garrett, welcome to the show. Gary, thanks, man. Yeah, what would the Rockefellers do? So that's uh, It's been pretty fascinating in the past few years, really like diving deep. I've always been, you know, asking that question to a certain degree. And man, the Vanderbilts had more money than the U.S. Treasury and went broke after 54 years when Cornelius died, even though his first son doubled their net worth in in nine years. And then, so we're talking about like 40 some years, they go broke, had mansions that got tore down, mansions in Rhode Island that are now like a tourist site that isn't even owned by them. And Anderson Cooper, who's an heir, didn't get any money from Gloria Vanderbilt, like to really support, like pretty crazy how that really got destroyed. Yet the Rockefellers are six generations strong, donated $50 million to charity last year. Their net worth went up. They've got hundreds of millions of dollars. I mean, you know, billions of dollars. Sorry. I mean, it's like, it's a, it's a pretty, you know, crazy thing because there wasn't that many differences that allowed that to sustain. So that's been really kind of fun. And when I was writing it, someone that's on the Rockefeller family office team reached out to me and said, you're spot on. I got to interview them a whole bunch. They actually became one of our clients uh, and we were able to quote them throughout the book. So that was, that was a fun project. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Well, the only uh, Vanderbilt who uh, made money uh, after Commodore Vanderbilt was uh, Gloria, right? I mean, uh, none of the others were able to make any money, let alone hold on to the fortune. So yet the Rockefellers somehow, uh, you know, I guess, uh, what was it? Was it a mindset? Was it uh, the sector of the economy they were in? How did they do it? They made a few really, really important choices. The first one was they created a family office. So they had an entire financial team that just worked for their family. And these were people that understood their mindset. They were there to protect and preserve their wealth, do true due diligence. So everything from asset protection or one of their major, major focuses was tax reduction. Mm. So that allowed them to have kind of a structure. And then they built like a board of trustees within their trust. They had a kind of a Rockefeller constitution, I might call it, that governed a lot of that trust that was in their kind of main philosophies and signposts that they had for the next generation. So it was a lot more dynamic than just dividing, distributing and destroying when the kids turned a certain age. So they had to actually borrow money from the trust. The kids had to have life insurance on them um, that had cash value and was permanent so that when they died, if they lost money in the trust, it got replenished in a tax-free manner. So, I mean, there's just a few of those nuances, but the thing is they actually spent time teaching the philosophies to the kids of how the wealth was built. So when, you know, uh, David Rockefeller recently died, he had 150,000 contacts in his Rolodex. So they understood relationship capital with their family office. They understood relationship capital with the connections that they had. And they understood that you had to have the right mental capital, which is the proper ideas, information, knowledge, wisdom, where a lot of people, if they start building wealth, they almost shy away from talking to their kids about it. Almost like that millionaire next door mentality, which is, overly frugal, pretend like it's not there. And then it gets blown pretty quickly because they don't know how to handle it when it comes into them and they don't have a team to protect them. And then the wolves come out and start pitching ideas. Like I've had in 2006, I had two business partners that died in a plane crash. 
I was a trustee for one of them. People within a month were talking about, oh, well, Les and I had a business idea and he was going to fund it or, oh yeah, I was going to do this. And mm -hmm. hey, will you invest in this? I mean, people just will come up and, and when people are in an emotional state, they make really poor decisions. Typically a family office shields that protects that, you know, a proper estate plan and asset protection shields that protects that saving tax is huge as people make more money. And I found 93% of people are tipping the government right now. And before someone invests another dollar, why not get your money back? That's rightfully yours. Cause that has a huge impact on people's bottom line. Oh yeah. Taxes. Uh, you're working basically half for yourself and half for the government of one form or another, even more. So. Yep. And there's like, there's a framework to save tax. I mean, the first thing is there's a lot of tax traps that people get, they get basically, you know, persuaded into one is, to defer tax. I think deferring tax is dangerous because since 1913, when the revenue act came out that, you know, created the U S tax code, it was going to be temporary. It started out like, you know, single digits. And now the average tops tax rate is over 60% since the inception. So we're actually at a historically low tax rate, even though it feels really high. And what if you defer into a time, there was a time where the top tax rates were over 90%. So I think people are dangerously deferring into the future, considering we have a $20 trillion debt. The other thing is people try to spend money to save tax. It never makes sense to spend a dollar to save tax. You know, don't spend a dollar to save 40 cents. I call that the tax tail wagging the dog. The three things that are much better is A, this is where it makes sense to make an investment. Hire great CPAs or tax attorneys. And if your CPA or tax attorney tells you they're conservative, what they really mean is I'm antiquated and I'm giving you an excuse of exactly why when you find out you overpaid tax, I don't have to be responsible. So far too many people aren't proactive. They don't meet with their team every quarter. If they own a building, they don't bring an engineer in that can actually do a cost segregation study and save yeah. them massive taxes. If they get over a couple million dollars of revenue, they don't bring in a tax attorney, which can probably double or triple their tax savings through the way they structure their corporations, to how, how they take their income, to if they set up their own private insurance company where they can put money in pre-tax and take it out as a capital gain in the future. I mean, there's just so many things that could be done with the proper tax team. The second thing is most people don't take all their deductions. So they have expenses that could have been deductions. Paying your kids can be a deduction if you can put them to work up to $6,300 a year of tax deductible income to you that's tax free to them or renting out your home 14 days a year for business purposes, that's tax-free income uh, to you and tax deductible to the business for 14 days or less, or anything that is a story that relates to the business. I mean, I made sure to make my wife 1% partner in some of my companies and we do, you know, annual retreats in really nice locations and write that off. Um, I have an intellectual property company. So every time I buy stuff to go on camera, even if I wear it later, it becomes a uniform that gets written off. People don't turn their expenses into deductions. That's the second thing that you do to save tax. And the third thing is reclassify income. If you're a business owner, you can set up a corporation. If you're an LLC, but it's, you're the only one in it, you're paying too much tax. If you have a partner, you can tax as a partnership that helps. If you don't want a partner, which is a lot of times the case, be an S corporation, take some salary, take the rest in distributions. Distributions don't get hit with self-employment tax. That's 15.3% savings right there, just on how you classify your income. I mean, we could go on and on, but the main thing is don't just defer, don't just spend. Instead, be proactive and build a team, turn your expenses and deductions through documentation and relating the story back to your business and reclassify your income. I mean, if you have a business doing less than $50,000 or part of your business doing less than $50,000, C Corp is taxed lower than an LLC or S Corp on $50,000 or less. So there's just, I mean, there's just so much opportunity there and it's money right to the bottom line that doesn't take hard work or scrimping or saving or taking any risk. And it's super risky to overpay tax because you only get three years to look back and amend your returns and get money back. So every three years, you should have a different set of eyes on your taxes to find out if you overpay. Hey, what about your investment goals uh, in terms of uh, helping you to avoid the Bernie Madoff traps out there? So there's a, there's a couple things when it comes to investing. Number one, I think you've got to stay in your lane. I call it investor DNA. Investor DNA is you get crystal clear about your values just so that 
You're only investing in things that you really are paying attention to, your drivers, the things that really you find yourself consistently learning about, and then your competencies, areas where you have unique insight. Like I could read a financial article and I have a photographic memory. I can read a technology article. I don't know what the hell they're talking about. So I'm investing in things that align with who I am. And then you focus instead of diversify. But what you do is when you focus, you build in all the protective measures you can. When banks are following their rules, not like what they did in 08 and earlier, but when they're following their rules, when someone you know wants to borrow money from a bank to buy a home, the bank wants to know about your taxes, your credit score. Mm-hmm. You don't put 20% down, they charge you PMI so that they can protect themselves even more. They want you to do a shorter term loan so they can get their money back even faster, which protects them from interest rate risk and also just default risk because the more equity you have in the asset, the more protected they are. And I can go on, but they do all these things to mitigate risk, whether it's through personal guarantees, collateral, insurance, you know, downside protection. So when you do invest, focusing will allow you to stay more engaged and related to the investment and then you protect it. So if you're invested in the market, put a trailing stop loss. So if the market goes down, you go, you don't participate in the entire downside. And a lot of people just sit there exposed. Or if someone's bringing you a private investment, make them do a personal guarantee, put collateral on the home. There's like, there's so much emphasis on return instead of return of money because return is seductive and sexy. Return of money may feel Feel boring until someone loses. And I feel like most of the wealth that's confiscated in this world is from erroneous, like people seeing a nice wrapping that looks like a great investment, but it's just a distraction in disguise. And I think that rookie investors always stay invested. They start early, they invest no matter what, they put it away through dollar cost averaging and they think they're in it for the long haul. But the professionals sit in cash for extended periods of time. And when there's chaos, And when everybody else is like not sure what to do, that's what Ted Turner did is he predatorily started buying land when it was going down. He didn't just buy it and hold it for the long haul. He bought companies when they were distressed. But most people, if they're only invested in the stock market, the market goes down. Now they're going, well, if I cash out, I realize a loss. I just need to wait. And all the opportunities all around them. And they miss out on the five to 20 major opportunities of their life because they're not liquid enough and because they didn't mitigate the downside when they do invest. And that absolutely not only harms their legacy, but drags their mind down to start feeling scarcity, worry, fear, more bleak about the future, and is absolutely one of the most destructive things to wealth. So um, I obviously have a lot to say about that topic. Yeah, I see. Hey, so, uh, so if you're somebody starting out now, let's say you just graduated from college, you got, you were fortunate enough to get a pretty good job. You don't have a lot of student loan debt or any, where would you be putting your money now? Coming out of school, I would put pretty much a hundred percent of my money into three places, the right people to start a business, the right processes for that business to thrive and be able to operate more efficiently day by day and the right tech or the right procedures, which would be automation and technology. So it could be scaled. So before I would invest in someone else's vision, someone else's dream, someone else's idea, I would really put that money because 91% of people worth $5 million or more did it because they own a business. We're in an economy that if you want to have some control of your outcomes, owning a business is key. So really the steps are, If you own a business, step one is make sure that you're mindful of your cash. I call it mindful cash management, that you're plugging the leaks. A, you're not overpaying the IRS. B, you're not overpaying on interest, which means having the right collateral, the right credit score, the right connections to the right institutions and relationships, and the right cash flow reporting. Number three, you're you're looking for every hidden fee and commission if you have existing investments or you go to allocate your money and you have someone that's like a, a, a financial detective looking for those things. And then finally, on your insurances, you make sure there's no duplicate coverages or costs. Then second, coming out of college, make sure you're strategically engineering wealth, which simply means what amount of money would have to come in from recurring revenue that would come in every month, even if you were just monitoring it, managing it and maintaining it, not on a daily basis, but a weekly or monthly basis, recurring revenue, not passive income, because passive income is a misnomer. There's no such thing as fully passive income. It will pass people by recurring revenue is assets kicking off cash flow. So look at your economic independence number, that number that covers your basic expenses in life and only invest to create more cash flow in a recurring revenue sense that gives you enough freedom that when you're economically independent, you can now swing for the fences in anything you do. The third thing is that we're only looking at that cash flow investing and looking at any asset that you have, that you're gifted, that you, that, you know, if you've got nothing, then you can, don't have to worry about this step, but it's accelerating investment income, only providing cash flow. Don't speculate. 
Don't invest outside of cash flow investing until you hit economic independence. Then the fourth step is, you know, investing in those three P's, which is the scaling business revenue. Build that business up, have that kick off massive amounts of cash flow, and then make sure that you're heavily liquid. Get a bunch of money in an account, which this is how you do it. Every time someone pays themselves, it's simple. George S. Clausen said it in the 1920s, pay yourself first. So have a second account at your institution that's not your business checking or your personal checking. It's just a regular check checking account, or it could be a money market or savings account, the return doesn't matter because it's not going to stay there forever, but always take a percentage off the top and use a sweep account that moves into the other account. Or if you have a payroll service, have them send two checks, one to one account, one to the other, and take 18% off the top so you could build up at least six months liquidity. So you have staying power and a peace of mind fund. So you'd be more productive. And then the fifth thing is treat yourself as your greatest asset. Invest back into yourself. Leaving college was just permission. That's not investing. Investing in yourself so that you could become a better investor, a better business person, that you could expose and increase your level of skill. That's where people start going wrong is they get in this frugality mindset and they start budgeting and they cut off the wrong expenses. There's more than one type of expense. There's destructive ones, get rid of those. There's lifestyle ones, pay cash for those, they're fine. There's protective expenses, the Rockefellers understood that. That's asset protection and transferring risk through insurance. But the most important expense is a productive expense. And learn to be an investor which says, if I invest a dollar in this person, this process or this procedure, will more than a dollar come out the other side? If so, keep putting money in it. Don't constrict it or restrict it through budgetary constraint. Instead, just when you pay yourself personally, take money off the top, don't borrow to consume, and life is gonna be infinitely easier if you follow those rules. Sounds like a very, uh, very practical and very workable set of rules there, Garrett. Uh, how'd you develop them? I made some damn tough mistakes. <laughs> yeah. That's the only way you learn. <laughs> I think a lot of financial people, um, when they make mistakes, they started in financial services June of 98. And in 98, 99, my you know, family, friends, and parents of my friends thought I was a financial Einstein because they made money. But the problem is everybody made money in the market at that yeah. time. In 2000, I was no longer financial Einstein. I was like, what the hell's going on? And I didn't want to tell them they were in it for the long haul, the market was on seller, all those cliches that are actually just excuses. And that's why I asked one question, what can I do in finance that's guaranteed? And I went on a journey for two years and two months, flying somewhere every month, interviewing the best financial people I could find, going to the best economic events, just investing so heavily in that, spent more money on that than by far uh, I would have cost to become a brain surgeon or go to the most expensive Ivy League schools. But I learned so much from that. And then, you know, I had a hundred pieces of real estate at one time. I did invested in two different IPOs. I invested in oil and gas. I had a hard money lending fund. Like, and when I started to see how institutions were working and I just started asking that question, how do, how do the banks make money? How do, how does wall street make money? What's on the other side? When I was 22, I saw someone that had made all their money by being a wall street person. And they only had, you know, 5% of their portfolio in the stock market. That was eye opening. I started researching more. You see people like Susie Ormond's, you know, stuff come out and you're like, Oh, they barely have any money in stocks yet. They're, they're really promoting that. And then I started being around business owners and saw the level of growth that they had. And then, so I just became a researcher and I hired people that I have two guys that they're maybe pretty much their full-time job is researching. They do writing as well, but their main job is researching. So I start collecting data. Then I go to meet like these great minds and there's other people that are doing, you know, major surveys. And so I just said, all right, how do I distill this into the simplest form of what people could follow and let's test it out. And in 2005, we tested it out on someone that was just so dedicated. He's like, I'll be your best student. And he became economically independent in 362 days. Wow. I was like, all right, you were, you're bad. But he was living off food storage. This guy was insane. I was like, no one else is going to do that. So what we assessed is with that framework I shared, it takes somewhere between three and seven years to get enough recurring revenue to, to cover your expenses. Three years if you're already frugal and you got some savings. Seven years if you're addicted to lifestyle. And, you know, you just have a bunch of loans that, that are inefficient. So between three and seven years is a whole hell of a lot better than 30 years with a whole lot less risk than what people are typically doing with normal retirement planning. 
So it sounds like you're a proponent, at least of some types of real estate investing, I guess, cash flow, real estate investing. Uh, how do you feel about that? Okay, so I feel like if someone's going to treat their real estate investing as a business, it could be a good investment. If they're going to get educated in it, it could be a good investment. If they're going to do it as an afterthought or as a passive thing, they're going to get their ass kicked by everybody else that's treating it seriously. And that's my problem is a lot of people just don't treat it seriously enough and they think it's going to be easy. But there is it is competitive. You do need to understand different market cycles. Really good at real estate investors know when the market's down, how to maybe do a uh, fractionalized ownership or uh, an auction and do a lease option or seller financing, or they, they made money on the buy because they bought properly. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and so I really feel like it has to be part of their investor DNA and that they really have to take it seriously. Otherwise they should avoid it because they could get over leveraged. And then when it isn't going well, get totally distracted and it might harm their existing business. So it definitely depends. And I think some gurus over promote real estate. And I, I, I loved it. I was on Kiyosaki's podcast and he said he really changed his tune in the last you know, couple of decades because when people ask him, should I invest in real estate? He goes, it really depends on who you are. And we really share the sentiment that risk isn't in the investment. Risk is in the investor. So you got to ask yourself, what kind of real estate investor are you? You know, I, I now only own less than five properties, like four properties um, instead of a hundred doors because they're just stuff that's on a lease option that are low maintenance. And then I just own like, you know, like my own stuff that I like my house I live in and, and uh, some land and, and a cabin that I don't consider an investment. I just consider kind of an enjoyment of life. But I really changed my tune on that because I learned how to license my material to other financial advisors and create recurring revenue. And I just made so much more money doing that. And so I like taking people and having them not recognize potential. Like I was just uh, uh, a few days ago with one of my good client, good friends and clients, Dr. Public about this. Yeah. Uh, he had a bunch of investments when I met him. I said, you doing all these investment stories. Like, I just want to be right. I call it a distraction. And instead, he just invented two things that complemented his business that both provide, both of them provided six figure returns. One was showing people how he did what he did. So business to business because yeah. he was business to consumer. And the second one was engaging them in all the people that helped him do that. And he got a paid affiliate on that. And, and you know, one of them rivals his main business now. So like, I want people to think about investments, not just as products, but think of it as things that complement your businesses mm -hmm. or things that complement your existing, like, assets that can be converted to cash flow. Right. I see. Yeah. So it makes, makes a lot of sense. Don't get involved in something, uh, especially real estate, unless you're going to treat it as a business, right? I mean, that's what it comes down to because okay. otherwise, yeah. uh, you could, you know, there's a lot of risk if you don't, uh, manage your real estate investments properly, uh, the risk can be enormous. Totally. And look, and there's also, you know, candidly, here's how I really came to that conclusion was, my first real estate deal I did was when I was 19. I was in college, but I, as I said, it's, I entered financial services at the time, even though I was just a product peddler originally. Uh, I bought my first home. It was a town home. Got a champ loan for the down payment, so I had no money out of pocket. Uh, did have to have a co-signer with my mom, but she did it. And then I refinanced it two years later. But I bought that property for $96,000 in Cedar City, Utah. Sold it for $170,000 seven years later. So that was, a, that was a great investment. I rented it out to you know other roommates while I lived there that required a little bit of effort. Uh, rented it out to, you know, other, other people once I left, including my sister went to school there. So that was a decent investment. Then my second real estate investment came just a few years later where my brother-in-law said, Hey, I'm going to buy this house. I need to have some earnest money for it. I paid, I gave him 25 grand. He gave me 50 grand back three months later. That's a 400% annualized return. Yeah, then I, I started talking that. more about real estate. My buddy, Joel, who was in Vegas calls me up. He's like, one of my friends is going to lose his house. Cause He's so far behind on his payments. So I bought the house. The guy got a job, leased the house back from me, cash yep. flowed a hundred bucks a month. So nothing on the cash flow, but I put no money down, used my wife's credit. And when he finally was able to get on his feet, I helped him with his credit. He was able to refinance the house and I got 90 grand. So the, my first three deals, I thought, I am a I'm a genius. This is amazing. You found the secret, I, right? Yeah. <laughs> you found the secret of infinite wealth. <laughs> yeah, so good. It's uh, um, luck. It's called, okay, yeah. I, I, all boats rise with the, tide, you know, with the tide, but at the same time, you find out who's swimming naked when the tide rolls back is what Warren Buffett says. Yeah. And damn. 
I ended up saying, well, if three's good, let's do a hundred and got overextended. And so I made a lot of money on some properties, but I got my, I got my ass handed to me on others. And it was purely out of greed because I actually knew in 2007, I wanted to liquidate right. my whole, po whole portfolio. But the problem is I put everything up for 10 to 15% above current market, hoping wow. that there was still some run left in it, which meant I sold a decent amount before 2008. But in 2008, we had to do a lot of work to lease option and, and we did auctions and we did so many crazy things to deal with that real estate portfolio. At the same time, I was launching a New York Times bestselling book, doing hundreds. I mean, my wife was like, you're, I don't even know who you are. I don't ever see you. So, so life kind of sucked. And I just want to give a, a fair warning to just because something works, we really need to assess how much knowledge we really had in that mental capital or if it was just a product of timing. Yeah, totally. Yeah, because, uh, you know, the old saying, uh, success has a thousand fathers and failure is an option. Well, when you're investing with the tide and the tide is going higher and higher, you think you tend to start thinking you're a genius. You start believing your own BS, if you will. And really, a lot of it is luck. And so I guess your strategy here, Garrett, really takes the luck to a large degree and the emotion out of it and focuses more on what actually works and what's going to win yeah. and and doing that for the long term and and obviously the world's greatest example of that by far are the rockefellers uh you know you just look who knows what they really own i mean it's impossible to really ascertain that um because there's so many vehicles that they do own but like you said over a hundred years and they're probably at least as wealthy or wealthier than ever as a whole, there's hundreds of Rockefellers now living off of that original trust, right? Yep. Hundreds of them. And it's growing. That's what's, yeah. yeah, like you said, though, there could be stuff in land trusts that we know nothing about. There could be stuff like in different type of shell corporations that you can't measure is really theirs. I mean, that right. kind of stuff can get really complicated when you're at that level of wealth. But we do know it's substantial. Yeah. We do know that it's growing. And there's other people that have, you know, in the book that we kind of highlight, like there's a, there was a, a partner of, of Carnegie that owned 20% and he left his kids with $10 million. So, uh, uh, it was just a small portion of his, of his uh, net worth that he said, this isn't to be touched, it's to be grown. And it's at 2 billion now. And it's with Bessemer Trust. So <laughs> like every story. his name. And we actually put the letter he wrote to his kid in the book. I just, I love seeing those examples because it just changed how I viewed so many things. I would and uh, how to preserve, protect, and perpetuate. You know? I would point out another one to you. He was Rockefeller's partner, John D. Rockefeller's partner, Henry Flagler. He basically developed the entire state of Florida, and then he's got a there's a museum in his honor in Palm Beach. His heirs still own the Breakers Hotel. All right. God only knows what it's really worth. It could easily be one of one of the few billion dollar hotel properties in the world. But they still own that. They sold off the Florida East Coast Railway, which is probably worth 10 times that to DuPont uh, many, many years ago. And that was his crowning uh, achievement, the Florida East Coast Railroad. But nonetheless, they managed to hold on to a vast part of the fortune. Um, and in fact, when they were going to knock down the mansion in the early 60s, mid 60s, the uh, daughter came out of obscurity, granddaughter, and basically put the money, wrote a check to convert the, uh, the mansion right. into a museum. So, yep. you know, they got something there and that, you know, he didn't really do anything, Henry Flagler, other than come up with the idea of how to run a national corporation uh, through a trust. Uh, because prior to that, every corporation had to be incorporated in all 48 states and uh, there was no national corporations. So he came up with that and his, his heirs are still profiting handsomely from it. So, uh, you know, he was worth a hundred million dollars or 150 in the early 1900s. So a lot of examples, uh, it, People want to get this book. I know you're going to want to get it. I want to get a copy of it and read it. Uh, I understand it's a thousand dollars on Amazon. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I'll just I'll I'll give you guys a copy on me rather than uh, invest a thousand bucks since you're listening. But uh, I'll tell you that my whole framework of that book is 
how this apply to everyone, not just the uber wealthy. Like how can people that are just graduating school start implementing this on a, on a small scale? And it's, I had bits and pieces that I got right, right from the time I was 19, but it's expanded so much. And really I pulled out the never filming strategy out of this and share it. So I think people enjoy it and you just got to text 801-396-7211 and put in the subject WWRD as in what would the Rockefellers do? 801-396-7211, WWRD, 801-396-7211. You'll get a download right. immediately. Um, and then if you want an actual physical copy, cover the shipping and we'll send you a physical copy um, once again on us. And, uh, I, you know, I, I'd love to have you at least read a page. If you get the book, you got to make sure to read the thing, you know, <laughs> and I did, I get like, my, Give them a my quiz. Extent, yeah, I, I'm piled with books everywhere. So yeah, what I think here. is if you go to the very back cover, it'll tell you like, Hey, if you're in this situation, go to this chapter. If you're in this, if this is more interesting, go to this chapter. And as a matter of fact, we could even have someone reach out and find out what the most impactful chapter is because we decided to start doing that. And people are like, oh my God, I've never had a book and had someone talk to me about it. But uh, yeah, this guy, Derek, who is just like loved it, impact his life so much. He's like, I want to talk to anyone and, and let him know how impactful this book is. So it's, uh, it's you great. know, uh, we'd love to have you read it. That's great, Garrett. It's been a real pleasure having you on. If you got any questions for Garrett or myself, I'd love to get your email. I insist you send us an email, kl at kerrylutz.com. The Twitter feeds at Carrie Lutz and the Facebook page is Financial Survival Network. Garrett, uh, it was a pleasure having you on. We're definitely going to have you on again and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Hey, thanks, Carrie. I really appreciate it. FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. It was a lot more dynamic than just dividing, distributing, and destroying when the kids turned a certain age. So they had to actually borrow money from the trust. The kids had to have life insurance on them um, that had cash value and was permanent so that when they died, if they lost money in the trust, it got replenished in a tax-free manner. So, I mean, there's just a few of those nuances, but the thing is they actually spent time teaching the philosophies to the kids of how the wealth was built. So when, you know, uh, David Rockefeller recently died, he had 150,000 contacts in his Rolodex. Mm -hmm. So they understood relationship capital with their family office. They understood relationship capital with the connections that they had. And they understood that you had to have the right mental capital, which is the proper ideas, information, knowledge, wisdom, where a lot of people, if they start building wealth, they almost shy away from talking to their kids about it. Almost like that millionaire next door mentality, which is, overly frugal, pretend like it's not there. And then it gets blown pretty quickly because they don't know how to handle it when it comes into them and they don't have a team to protect them. And then the wolves come out and start pitching ideas. Like I've had in 2006, I had two business partners that died in a plane crash. I was a trustee for one of them. People within a month were talking about, oh, well, Les and I had a business idea and he was going to fund it or, oh yeah, I was going to do this. And mm -hmm. hey, will you invest in this? I mean, people just will come up and, and when people are in an emotional state, they make really poor decisions. Typically a family office shields that protects that, you know, a proper estate plan and asset protection shields that protects that saving tax is huge as people make more money. And I found 93% of people are tipping the government right now. And before someone invests another dollar, why not get your money back? That's rightfully yours because that has a huge impact on people's bottom line. Oh yeah, taxes, uh, you're working basically half for yourself and half for the government of one. You can put them to work up to $6,300 a year of tax deductible income to you that's tax free to them or renting out your home 14 days a year for business purposes, that's tax free income uh, to you and tax deductible to the business for 14 days or less or anything that is a story that relates to the business. I mean, I made sure to make my wife 1% partner in some of my companies and we do, you know, annual retreats in really nice locations and write that off. Um, I have an intellectual property company. So every time I buy stuff to go on camera, even if I wear it later, it becomes a uniform that gets written off. People don't turn their expenses into deductions. That's the second thing that you do to save tax. And the third thing is reclassify income. If you're a business owner, you can set up a corporation if you're an LLC, but it's you're the only one in it, you're paying too much tax. If you have a partner, you can tax as a partnership, that helps. If you don't want a partner, which is a lot of times the case, 
be an S corporation, take some salary, take the rest in distributions. Distributions don't get hit with self-employment tax. That's 15.3% savings right there, just on how you classify your income. I mean, we could go on and on, but the main thing is don't just defer, don't just spend. Instead, be proactive and build a team, turn your expenses and deductions through documentation and relating the story back to your business and reclassify your income. I mean, if you have a business doing less than $50,000 or part of your business doing less than $50,000, C-Corp is taxed lower than an LLC or S-Corp on $50,000 or less. So there's just, I mean, there's just so much opportunity there and it's money right to the bottom line that doesn't take hard work or scrimping or saving or taking any risk. And it's super risky to overpay tax because you only get three years to look back and amend your returns and get money back. So every three years, you should have a different set of eyes on your taxes to find out if you overpay. Hey, what about your investment goals uh, in terms? FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. Welcome. You are listening to the Financial Survival Network. I'm Kerry Lutz. It's August 14th, 2017. Uh, this month's almost gone. I mean, we're really uh, going through 2017 like it's nothing. I hope you've it's been a great year for you. You've been accomplishing your goals and we're always trying to bring you information, guests that will help you cut through the nonsense and really, really get down to what's important, workable strategies to help people you and your family become more secure and and more prosperous, of course. Uh, and that means we've got Garrett Gunderson with us today. Garrett, you are an entrepreneur, financial advocate, and founder of Wealth Factory and author of a couple of books, the New York Times bestselling book, Killing Sacred Cows. And recently, uh, you've got a book out that you'll have a special offer for it later, uh, What Would the Rockefellers Do?, which I find the title quite intriguing. Uh, first, if you got any questions, as always, for myself or Garrett, email us at kl at kerrylutz.com. Garrett, welcome to the show. Gary, thanks, man. Yeah, what would the Rockefellers do? So that's uh, It's been pretty fascinating in the past few years, really like diving deep. I've always been, you know, asking that question to a certain degree. And man, the Vanderbilts had more money than the U.S. Treasury <laughs> and went broke after 54 years when Cornelius died, even though his first son doubled their net worth in in nine years. And then, so we're talking about like 40 some- One or another, even more. So. Yep, and there's like, there's a framework to save tax. I mean, the first thing is there's a lot of tax traps that people get, they get basically, you know, persuaded into. One is to defer tax. I think deferring tax is dangerous because since 1913, when the Revenue Act came out that, you know, created the U.S. tax code, it was going to be temporary. It started out like, you know, single digits. And now the average top tax rate is over 60% since the inception. So we're actually at a historically low tax rate, even though it feels really high. And what if you defer into a time, there was a time where the top tax rates were over 90%. So I think people are dangerously deferring into the future, considering we have a $20 trillion debt. The other thing is people try to spend money to save tax. It never makes sense to spend a dollar to save tax. You know, don't spend a dollar to save 40 cents. I call that the tax tail wagging the dog. The three things that are much better is A, this is where it makes sense to make an investment. Hire great CPAs or tax attorneys. And if your CPA or tax attorney tells you they're conservative, what they really mean is I'm antiquated and I'm giving you an excuse of exactly why when you find out you overpaid tax, I don't have to be responsible. So far too many people aren't proactive. They don't meet with their team every quarter. If they own a building, they don't bring an engineer in that can actually do a cost segregation study and save yeah. them massive taxes. If they get over a couple million dollars of revenue, they don't bring in a tax attorney, which can probably double or triple their tax savings through the way they structure their corporations, to how, how they take their income, to if they set up their own private insurance company where they can put money in pre-tax and take it out as a capital gain in the future. I mean, there's just so many things that could be done with the proper tax team. The second thing is most people don't take all their deductions. So they have expenses that could have been deductions. Paying your kids can be a deduction if in years they go broke, had mansions that got tore down, mansions in Rhode Island that are now like a tourist site that 
isn't even owned by them. And Anderson Cooper, who's an heir, didn't get any money from Gloria Vanderbilt, like to really support, like pretty crazy how that really got destroyed. Yet the Rockefellers are six generations strong, donated $50 million to charity last year. Their net worth went up. They've got hundreds of millions of dollars. I mean, you know, billions of dollars. Sorry. I mean, it's like, it's a, it's a pretty, you know, crazy thing because there wasn't that many differences that allowed that to sustain. So that's been really kind of fun. And when I was writing it, someone that's on the Rockefeller family office team reached out to me and said, you're spot on. I got to interview them a whole bunch. They actually became one of our clients uh, and we were able to quote them throughout the book. So that was, that was a fun project. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Well, the only uh, Vanderbilt who uh, made money uh, after Commodore Vanderbilt was uh, Gloria, right? I mean, uh, no, none of the others were able to make any money, let alone hold on to the fortune. So yet the Rockefellers somehow, uh, you know, I guess, uh, what was it? Was it a mindset? Was it uh, the sector of the economy they were in? How did they do it? They made a few really, really important choices. The first one was they created a family office. So they had an entire financial team that just worked for their family. And these were people that understood their mindset. They were there to protect and preserve their wealth, do true due diligence. So everything from asset protection or one of their major, major focuses was tax reduction. Mm. So that allowed them to have kind of a structure. And then they built like a board of trustees within their trust. They had a kind of a Rockefeller constitution, I might call it, that governed a lot of that trust that was in their kind of main philosophies and signposts that they had for the next generation. 